It's good to be with us together, isn't it? It feels like ages since I was here. I think it's two weeks. That feels like ages, doesn't it? Uh, two weeks, I know. It feels like a month. If you don't know me, my name's Dave. I'm the pastor here. Let's just uh, pray again as we come to God's word. Father, would you speak that we might hear and obey and respond to your word this morning? Oh, man. Well, grab that passage open in your Bibles. But I want to start, I want to start off with this morning. Uh, we're thinking this morning about marriage. And I want to start off with a few quotes about marriage. Uh, so here's one. You might have heard this one. Marriage is a wonderful institution. But who wants to live in an institution? If I heard that one. Here's one. Okay. Marriage is husband secretly lowers the thermostat, and I secretly turn it back up. We both vehemently deny touching it. Uh, Nothing to do with our house, that one, at all. Oh, here's another one. Uh, I married for love, but the obvious side benefits of having someone around to find my glasses cannot be ignored. Oh, is that a final one here? Marriage has no guarantees. If that's what you're looking for, Go live with a car battery. Well, I read those. I wonder what you would say about marriage. And maybe you've got a generally positive experience about marriage and you hear those quotes and you think, well, that's a bit cynical, that's a bit negative. Or maybe your experience of marriage is difficult and painful and disappointing. And you read those quotes and you think, yeah, why would anyone bother being married? Maybe you're here and you're not married, and you'd long to be. Maybe you're widowed or divorced or single. And for all these things, that the thought of marriage just brings significant source of pain. And as we look at this passage, we're thinking this morning about God's view of marriage. And how do our lives fit into that? What is marriage, and how does it fit with God's created purpose. Uh, Because if you've been here over the last couple of weeks, that's been really clear, isn't it? That that God's word here is showing us who we are and who we were made to be and what we were made to do. And if you remember back to chapter one, the the kind of glory and, and wonder and majesty of being created. Let me read to you chapter one, 27 to 28. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves along the ground. And you remember the joy and the excitement of being created, not just created with care, and love, but created in God's image with a purpose to be God's image bearers, to to show to all of creation what does it mean to live out being under God, to to rule the earth as as ruled rulers. And chapter 2, we saw the goodness of the earth, this this garden made with beauty and, and the flowing water and the precious jewels and filled with plants and animals. And the man was put in the garden to work the garden and to keep the garden, to tend it and to serve it. I guess if you do a lot of gardening, you'd identify with that. And to protect the beauty of the garden and to enhance its fruitfulness. And man was given a purpose. And as we think about marriage, and as we think about male and, and female, and we think about these ways that relationships are meant to be, we think about it with this backdrop of humanity created and purposed by God. This backdrop of humanity created and purposed by God. And we've seen all the the wonder of creation. And then, actually, as we get into the passage, verse 18, was anyone surprised by verse 18? The Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. 
I will make a helper suitable for him. I mean, and you think, well, hang on. God, you made everything so far, and everything was good, and indeed very good. And now God says it is not good for the man to be alone. And you think, well, well hang on. Why is that not good? And we need to think, to understand that, we need to think about the context. So Adam is being alone. It's not not good because he's somehow unfulfilled. He's like a sort of lonely bachelor waiting for his true love. No, it's not not good because Adam is somehow less than human as a single man. Sometimes singleness is made to look like that, isn't it? You're not quite human. No, Adam is everything that he needs to be. He's fully in God's image. It's not not good because Adam can't be happy on his own. No, he's got the fullness of fellowship with God in a way that we could really only imagine. Why is it not good? It's not good because Adam on his own cannot fulfill his creation purpose. Adam on his own cannot fill the earth and subdue it. He needs help. What will God do? Well, look with me at verse 19. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. Whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky and all the wild animals. And you see here the man taking on the God's rule in creation. And to name something is to have authority over it, to, to exercise leadership. And he takes on this leadership of the birds and the animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. What is done? I read on. So the Lord God called the man to fall, caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he'd taken out of the man and brought her to the man. What does God do? From Adam's side, his rib, he makes a woman as, God, as Adam's companion, Adam's helper. And he brings her to Adam. And God uniquely, specially creates this helper so that Adam can carry out his created purpose. And as we look at this, we need to see some, some important things, don't we, that speak directly to the differences between men and women. That, that men and women, male and female, are equal but different. Actually, perhaps that's oddly controversial in our culture. But it's really clear, isn't it, that the man and the woman are equal but different. And they are both needed for God's created purpose. That the woman is equal to the man. Both are made in the image of God. Both given this created purpose. God created mankind, humanity in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Both in the image of God. No sense that the woman has any less worth or value or preciousness in God's sight. Because her creation is different. That both are made gloriously valuable in the sight of God. And that's his, as Christians here, we need to be honest that the church has not spoken loudly enough at times about this. That both men and women have equal dignity and worth and value in God's sight and in achieving God's purpose. That there is no way that women are of lesser value than men. And the church has not said that loudly enough. That only a truly Christian worldview can equally value both men and women. And yet we see too from this passage that, that the woman has a different role to the man. Not a different purpose, but a different role within that purpose of filling and subduing, of keeping and guarding. How do we see that? We see that the woman is created as a helper for the man. That she is created from the man, and that the man names her like he named the animals. And we see, don't we, through the Bible, that Adam is given the ultimate accountability for what happens. 
that actually it's Adam's fall that reverberates through the Bible. The representative of humanity, not Adam and Eve. That there is this created role difference between men and women. That they're not interchangeably the same, but beautifully different. And actually, we need to be really clear. Helper does not mean inferior. So the, the word that is translated helper here, it's used 19 times in the Old Testament. 16 of those times, it refers to God. This is a strong word. And to help man to, to, to work at this creation purpose is a godly and noble task. And did you see too, a helper suitable for him? There's a lot in that word, isn't there? A complementarity, a matching, a fitting with. Just think, if, if all he'd wanted was some help with the digging and the weeding, to be honest, a man, another man, would probably have been a better bet, wouldn't it? I mean, on average, men are physically stronger. They're probably more helpful. They're usually taller, aren't they, for pruning the trees? But God doesn't create another man. He creates a complementary helper. Now, it's obvious some of what's complementary is procreation, isn't it? That God made us to fill the earth through the sexual union of a man and a woman. That We're not like amoebas, are we? We don't kind of split down the middle. But there's more than that, isn't there? That, that God has created men and women differently. And they go about their tasks in different ways, don't they? different strengths and weaknesses. Now, we need to be cautious as we say this. We've got to be really cautious, haven't we, about generalizing. That, that, that not every man is the same, nor every woman, nor, nor all their strengths and weaknesses. But generally, men are more likely to take risks and to push forward in the face of hostility. Generally, women are more likely to be empathetic and nurturing. Again, that, that, don't, don't miss here. The Bible doesn't go into detail to define this complementarity. But the point is very clear that men and women are different. Equal, but different. I mean, we've, we've heard it in a thousand sexist jokes, haven't we? We've heard a thousand jokes that play upon the difference between men and women. And to be honest, they're not really very funny. But they work... Like most jokes, they work because there is a grain of truth in them, isn't there? That men and women are different. And that is part of the beauty of creation. That women are created as a complementary helper for men. And the problem comes when the difference in roles and their strengths and weaknesses, the problem becomes when that's a cause for superiority and abuse and mockery, rather than seeing the beauty of God in their different roles. I want to read a quote from uh, someone called Matthew Henry, who writes a lot about the Bible. And he wrote these, these words. The woman is not made out of Adam's head to top him, nor out of his feet to be trampled upon by him, but out of his side to be equal with him, under his arm to be protected, and near his heart to be beloved. Isn't that just a beautiful picture of the equality and complementarity of male and female in marriage? And what happens? Adam's thrilled, isn't he? And he writes this love poem. This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. I thought about reading some more Love poems, but I think this is probably touchy your feely enough already, isn't it? But Adam is delighted with the woman that God has made. And he names the woman with the joy of a kind of tender lover. And this is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife and they become one flesh. That marriage involves the, the stepping out from father and mother and the creation of a new family unit. That this one flesh union. This purposeful union. 
What is one flesh? Well, obviously, at his most basic level, it's sexual union, isn't it? But it's more than that. A union of heart and life, of purpose and value. And using this complementarity to work together in God's purposes. A union that continues to grow and, and flourish as we go further on in married life. I was thinking about this. Uh, um, I've remembered this. A couple of years ago, I got this book out of the library when I went on holiday. And the kind of books I get out of the library to go on holiday are not great works of literature, I have to say. Um, uh, yeah, and this is not a great work of literature. Uh, it's quite good on your holidays. Um, but it's written about the heroes, and they are um, divers, they're kind of marine salvage experts, and th- there's a kind of series of them. Uh, and these, these characters are in it. And I can't remember what the plot was, and there, there was some kind of nuclear bomb or bacteria that was going to destroy. You know the kind of thing, don't you, a terrorist or something like that. But the thing that was unusual about the book, the thing that really stuck in my mind, is that the heroes are a married couple. And you, you don't really notice as you're reading it, but you think afterwards, well, how often is that the case? How often do you read a book or you watch a film and the heroes are a married couple? It's actually less common than you'd think. Uh, usually the, 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 the couple get married and that's the end. But here in this book, as to be honest, in most of life, the hard work and the service come after the marriage. But actually, shouldn't churches be like that? Places that celebrate marriage and the wonderful service that comes from the, the partnership of men and women. Uh, maybe saving the world from terrorists, maybe just the normal stuff of church. And how many people do we know in church that the service of both is improved by their marriage? Those of you who are married, you may have experienced this. That, that's the case in our marriage, that I don't think Becca or I would be remotely as useful on our own. I see, I learned from her empathy and patience and the ability to listen Uh, and she now knows exactly what we're looking for in a kid's bike Uh, and we complement one another but but isn't that a call for us to be countercultural in what we value as a church you think everybody everyone loves a good wedding don't they everyone gets really excited about a wedding we go out into the village people are really excited about a wedding Shouldn't our excitement be in the couple that has been married for 50 years and are are celebrating their anniversary? Or or we love a a new baby. Everyone's excited about a new baby. Shouldn't we celebrate all the more the faithful parenting through teens and 20s and, and 30s and beyond as children grow up and we continue to love them? That we celebrate the service of marriage in the long haul. But we've got to stop here, haven't we? Because actually, probably for all of us, probably for all of us, whether we're married or not, we know that marriage does not live up to this ideal. And if we're married or we've seen other people's marriages, that how often they're they're marred by bitterness and selfishness and and sin and and abuse of power and all the, the wicked things that marriages are tainted with. Maybe we're divorced or single or or widowed. And marriage is just a source of sadness and frustration. Why is it not like how it should be? Well, we're going to see all the more next week about that, about how this beautiful pattern is twisted and, and broken. But I just want you to stay with me as we see things for how they were meant to be, and then we'll reflect a bit more on how they are. And then next week, we'll see and understand more still about why they are how they are. So stay with me as we think about this beautiful pattern. And and what do we learn from it? Well, it helps us, doesn't it? It helps us get some wrong ideas about marriage out of the way. Um, So firstly, women don't have more ribs than men. Uh, Google has reassured me on that. Uh, pretty much everybody has 24 ribs. Um, so that's the wrong idea out of the way. Uh, but more seriously, 
this passage reminds us that, that, that marriage is not a human invention. It's not something that's kind of shaped and created by people. And, and therefore we're free to alter it as, as culture changes. Marriage is God's design. You may not have seen it. There, there's a, a pressure in a certain number of countries, I would imagine it would come here at some point, to legalize three-person marriages. Uh, and you think, well, why is that a problem? Apart from the fact it's bad enough, isn't it, to remember one birthday. But it's a problem because it doesn't reflect God's pattern of equality and complementarity. And so we're not free to move from God's created pattern. What else? Marriage isn't the destination. Isn't that the lie of a, a thousand romantic movies? The goal of life is to be in a relationship. And when you're married, that's the end. Mission accomplished. No, marriage is not redemption. It's not the goal. It is one joyful way that we serve together. If we're married, it's for a reason. If we're single or divorced or widowed, it's for a reason. To fulfill God's purposes. What else? Well, you see here, don't you, that marriage was not meant to be a a temporary arrangement. It wasn't God's design for, for this one flesh union to be broken. And that's why it hurts so much. And the world kind of shrugs its shoulders and said, well, divorces happen. And that's not what we see here, is it? What we see here is the reason why it hurts so much is because God didn't intend it to be. That it happens as a result of selfishness and fallenness and brokenness. And I know that loads of you know that. And again, we'll see more of that next week. But we see here that marriage in God's pattern is this beautiful plan for serving his purposes. And yet in a fallen world, how hard that is to see and feel. A place where we can be open and vulnerable and find strength in service together. Is that not what we'd hope for? That Adam and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. How often is it that you you look at the world outside and you watch on TV and it, it makes the picture of sex look so alluring? That the attractiveness of sex is kind of free and easy sex with anyone that you like, as often as you like. And the biblical picture looks dull and repressive. Sex only within marriage is so boring. And how different that reality is. How that is a lie. That young people are are pressured into sex that they don't want or humiliated afterwards. It's horrible to think about revenge porn or sexting. And how often that the, the reality of sex in a fallen world is that experience of shame. And the biblical picture is a man and his wife delighted with one another who felt no shame. Or, or think of the distinction of roles. How often does it look repressive and archaic to see a gender distinction? To see men lead and the, the woman his complementary partner? And again, we need to acknowledge that this in the church has been abused and got wrong. uh, And we need to repent where that's been done wrongly. But the reality is that that in a world that is confused about gender, no one knows who either men or women are supposed to be. That the Bible pattern here creates a space for men and women to flourish and to be equal and different. I read in the story, I was reading an article in the paper about the the growth of of same-sex relationships among teenage girls. Uh, And it said one of the the factors in the growth, and it wasn't the only factor, but one of the causes of growth of same-sex relationships for teenage girls was just the general uselessness of teenage boys. Uh, And it said that the the girls they spoke to, they were not interested in a relationship with, with men because they, quote, they just spend their time taking drugs and watching pornography on their phones. Now, it's a pretty damning statement on all teenage boys, and, you know, it won't be generally true, but it is a far cry, isn't it, from, the, from Adam and Eve as these fellow heroes 
working together. A failure of young men to take the lead. And it just shows what happens as society turns more and more in on itself. It's just confused. And it calls for us as a church to model in our marriages this beauty and purpose. Now, that, that marriage is not a goal in itself. But instead, God uses those who are married to, to draw in others, to be hospitable and open-hearted. That it creates families and equips and sustains churches. And it models the giving and receiving of love and forgiveness. And marriage is for everyone in the church, not, not just to make those who are married feel better. But again, there is this ever-present bomb note in this, isn't there? Uh, if you listen to last week's sermon, Richard described it so well, it's like hearing music from another world. That we long for this, but we never quite get there. It's true, isn't it? That, that the marriages we see are too tainted by sin. Just so far from this ideal, maybe broken by divorce or broken by the death of a spouse. That, that daily heartache that we're not in what was promised. And is this everything that we've got to say? We just promise something, this is what it could be, but you'll never get there. Or what about those who have never married and may never marry? Are they just outside of God's purposes? No. No. Just as we live this side of the fall, yet as Christians we live in this community, this family of God's people. And as God's church, we experience all the blessings of marriage and relationship with the one who made us perfect and beautiful and married us. This is why that our most fulfilling relationship is not with our spouse, but with the Lord Jesus. At the end of the day, marriage was created as a picture and a signpost to point to the fulfillment of relationship with Jesus. And in his community, we relate to one another as his new family. Not one flesh, but one spirit. That Hope Community Church are one spirit with one another and with the Lord Jesus. And just like Adam, Adam delights in Eve, doesn't he? He loves her. This is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. That is how the Lord Jesus looks upon his bride, his church, you if you are a believer, the Lord Jesus says, this is spirit of my spirit and I love you. Maybe you don't feel very beautiful this morning. Maybe you feel like you're lacking in God's creation purpose. This morning, the Lord Jesus has made you beautiful in his righteousness. Because he loves you. This is now spirit of my spirit. One of the lies about marriage is that this is your most fulfilling relationship. And it's not. In heaven, there will be no marriage. It won't be needed. We will each one of us have the fullness of intimate relationship with the Lord Jesus that starts now. Because he loves you far more than Adam loved Eve. He loves you enough to die for you. In every way, our marriages are not what they're meant to be. They're not what they could have been. But our relationship with the Lord Jesus, that is now how we fulfill God's purposes. That, that here around us are these wonderful relationships of love and sacrifice and care and service. Here in the church is spirit of my spirit. Here in our Lord is wonderful sacrificial love. Whether you're married or single or divorced or widowed, Jesus loves you. If you're not a Christian, this is an invitation to the most fulfilling and glorious relationship that you could imagine. No doubt you will have been let down and bruised and broken by other relationships. Other people will have used you for their own ends. Other people will have twisted and distorted this. Jesus will not do that. Jesus will love you as Adam should have done. And he will always be trusted and always care for your best interests. 
and always serve your ultimate spiritual well-being. And he calls us his beloved people.